impose free public college tuition and student loan forgiveness for most families. Why should wealthy families be able to send their kids to public college for free? Why not concentrate that government help on those most in need? So, as I've talked about before, I have a two-cent wealth tax proposed for uh, millionaires and billionaires, and that gives us enough money to invest in all of our babies, age zero to five, to put an historic $800 billion investment in public schools, K through 12, and that will permit us to offer technical school to your college, for your college, for every single person who wants an education, cancel student loan debt for 50, uh, 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 put a $50 billion investment in our historically black colleges and universities and cancel student loan debt for 43 million Americans. Look, this is about money, but this is also about values. We need to make an investment in our future. And the best way to do that is let's invest in the public education of our children. That starts when they're babies and it goes long after high school. We want to have families, I meet families every day in the selfie lines who talk about what it means to be crushed by student loan debt. That's why I have a proposal popular among Democrats, popular among Republicans, popular among independents to ask those at the top to pay a little more so somebody can get rid of that student loan debt so they can make an investment in themselves, start a small business, buy a car, create you, a Senator. future for themselves and for this country. Thank you, Senator. I see some hands, but I, I want to go to Mayor Buttigieg. Hello, Mayor Buttigieg, your plan offers free or discounted public college only to families making up to $150,000 a year. Do you think Senator Warren's plan offers free college to too many families? I do think that if you're in that lucky top 10%, I, I still wish you well. Don't get me wrong. I just want you to go ahead and pay your own tuition. Now, we can still have public service loan forgiveness for those who go into lower income fields to deal with that. But if you're in that top 10 percent, I think you're going to be, for the most part, OK. And there is a very real choice on where every one of these tax dollars goes. So I very much agree with Senator Warren on raising more tax revenue from millionaires and billionaires. I just don't agree on the part about spending it on millionaires and billionaires when it comes to their college tuition. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mayor Wait, 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 wait. You. No, he mentioned I'm me by you, name. I'm going to let you no, respond, Senator Warren. Go, go Look, the mayor wants billionaires to pay one tuition for their own kids. I want a billionaire to pay enough to cover tuition for all of our kids because that's how we build a future. The other part is we've got to deal with student loan debt. And right now, most of the people on this stage are nibbling around the edges of a huge student loan debt burden that disproportionately affects people of color. African Americans are more likely to have to borrow money to go to school, more likely to borrow more money while they're in school, and have a harder time paying it off. We want to make an investment in the future, then open up education for all of our kids. That's how Thank we you, build Senator, the future. Senator Sanders, could I respond to we believe, I believe, in the concept of universality. And one of the crises in America today is people are sick and tired of filling out forms. So you, you're not eligible for the program today because you're at 150, but you lost your job, are you eligible? You get a better job, you're eligible. I think what we have to do is what we do with Social Security, what we do with public education. Donald Trump's kids can go to a public school. They should be able to go to a public school. What we need right now is a revolution in education. We have got to end this dysfunctional child care system and make sure that every working class person in this country can find high quality, affordable child care. We need to make public colleges and universities tuition free and by taxing billionaires and by taxing Wall Street, we will cancel all student debt in this country. Thank, thank you, Senator Sanders. Tim? Switching gears here, Mr. Steyer, earlier this year in Iowa, I met a father, Bill Stump, and his son, Kyle, in Dubuque. Kyle is a remarkable young adult with significant disabilities, and though he's been employed for about five years at a local pizza parlor, the future is very uncertain for his family. Bill worries that there aren't enough jobs, living facilities, social programs designed to meet the needs of his son. So I'm wondering, as president, are there specific steps 
that you would take to help people like Kyle become more integrated into the workforce and into their local community? Look, the United States has made a commitment to treat everybody equally. And that means supporting people with disabilities, both in terms of education and later when they're part of the workforce. That means bringing the resources to bear to make sure that we're treating them fairly in school and after school to try and integrate them fully and to make them have as full a life as possible. The question we've got here across the board is, can we afford to do the kinds of things that Senator Sanders and Senator Warren are pushing? And the answer is yes. Okay. That in fact, what we need to do is to undo the tax breaks that have been given for two generations to rich Americans and big corporations. Last year, corporate, the top 400 corporations paid an 11% tax. That is absolutely ludicrous. Could I answer the question? So the answer on disabilities is a question of focus and money, as so many of these questions are. We have a country where the government is broken because corporations have bought it, they're getting their way, and for us to get back to government of, by, and for the people that serves Americans, including Americans with disabilities, we're gonna have to take that back. Thank I have a thank you. Mr. Needs. Yang, I didn't hear a specific answer from Mr. Steyer. Can you outline specific steps that the government should take to help integrate these young people into the workforce and into their local communities? I would love it. Uh, I have a son with special needs. And to me, special needs is the new normal in this country. How many of you all have a family member or a friend or a neighbor with special needs or autism? If you look around, most hands went up. The fact is right now we have to do more for Kyle. Special needs children are going to become special needs adults in many cases. And here's the challenge. We go to employers and say, hey, this special needs person can be a contributor in your workplace, which may be correct, but that's not the point. We have to stop confusing economic value and human value. We have to be able to say to our kids and Kyle that you have intrinsic value because you're an American and you're a human being. We're going to put a freedom dividend of $1,000 a month in everyone's hands, which is going to help families around the country adapt. And then we're going to take this burden off of the communities and off of the schools who do not have the resources to support kids like my son and make it a federal priority, not a local one, so they're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Could we I have to move this? on. Judy. Come on. Come on. Come on. Very specific. Um, Senator Warren, 45 seconds to you, please. So, I was a special education teacher, and I loved that work because it gave me a chance to work straight out with people to recognize the worth of every human being. I had four to six-year-olds who were in special ed. And what do we need to do? That's why I have a plan as a special ed teacher to fully fund IDEA. So every child with disabilities will get the full education they need. My housing plan is about investing in more housing across this country, in rural America, in urban America, in small town America, but it's also about making sure that people who want to live independently, people who have disabilities, will have housing available to them. I make a part of my job to spill that we are gonna make sure as president, I will make sure that the people who wanna bid on federal contracts are treating people with disabilities fairly and paying them fairly. You've got to go at it at every part of what we do, because as a nation, this is truly a measure of who we are. We believe in treating these, the least of thy brethren, as people of value, and that is how we make a better America. Thank you, Senator Warren. Thank you, Senator Warren. Judy? Yeah, I know we have a lot of hands up. We have so many important topics to discuss. I want to come to you, Senator Klobuchar, on a question of the judges. President Trump has appointed, as we know, two Supreme Court justices, but he's also had confirmed nearly 200 federal judges, most of whom are young and could shape American law for decades to come. Some of them you voted for in the Senate, including one who just yesterday joined a ruling to strike down a key part of the Affordable Care Act. Would President Trump's appointees, my question is, make it harder for you as president, for any of you on this stage, to enact your agenda? Um, of course. And I want to make it clear that I've opposed many, many judges. And I think everyone will remember what happened at the Kavanaugh hearing. When that nominee went after me, I stood my ground and he had to apologize. 
So I have been very strong on these judges. As for the judge you just referred to, there was actually the judge that wrote the opinion was a judge that went through the Senate unanimously with support uh, by Senator Sanders, with support by uh, President Obama, with support by uh, then Senator Kennedy. So I, I think it is very important when we look at these judges to acknowledge uh, that there are some of these judges that you think are going to be okay, and they aren't. But what would I do as president? I would appoint judges that are in the vein of people like Elena Kagan and Justice Breyer and Sonia Sotomayor, and let's not forget the notorious RBG. That's what I would do. And if you look at my record as a lawyer and a member of the Judiciary Committee, uh, look at the judges that I recommended to President Obama. Uh, people uh, like Mimi Wright, uh, who's a superstar, and Susan Richard Nelson. Look at who I put in uh, as the uh, first openly gay marshal in the history of the United States. I did that because I knew they were qualified people to take those jobs. And you need to do it not only with the right judges and have that know-how, but you also have to do it right away. That is one thing that we all learned from when President Obama was in. And that was that he was dealing with an economic crisis and it was hard to do it right away. But we have to immediately start putting judges on the bench to fill vacancies so that we can reverse the horrific nature of these Trump judges. A follow up to uh, Mayor Buttigieg. Beyond a pledge not to overturn Roe versus Wade, which I believe all of you have said would be part of your decision making and choosing uh, a nominee to the court. Are there other litmus tests that you would apply in choosing federal judges? The Supreme Court is very personal for me because my household, my marriage, exists by the grace of a single vote on that body. And yes, uh, it is critical that we have justices who understand that American freedom includes reproductive rights and reproductive freedom. But that's not all. I expect an understanding that voting rights are human rights. I expect an understanding that equality is required of us all. And I expect a level of respect for the rule of law that prevents this body from coming to be viewed as just one more partisan battlefield, which is why I will not only appoint judges and justices who reflect this worldview, but also begin moving to reform the body itself, as our country has done at least half a dozen times in its history, so that it is not one more political battlefield every single time a vacancy comes up. Yamish. Senator Sanders, at least 22 transgender people were killed in the United States this year. Most of them transgender women of color. Each of you has said you would push for the passage of the Equality Act, a comprehensive LGBTQ civil rights bill. But if elected, what more would you do to stop violence against transgender people? We need moral leadership in the White House. We need a president who will do everything humanly possible to end all forms of discrimination against the transgender community, against the African-American community, against the Latino community, and against all minorities in this country. But above and beyond providing the moral leadership of trying to bring our people together, what we also need for the transgender community is to make sure that health care is available to every person in this country, regardless of their sexual orientation or their needs. And that is why I strongly support and have helped lead the effort for a Medicare for all single payer program, which will provide comprehensive health care to all people, including certainly the transgender community. Thank, th thank you, Senator Sanders. Senator Warren? The transgender community has been marginalized in every way possible. And one thing that the President of the United States can do is lift up attention, lift up their voices, lift up their lives. Here's a promise I make. I will go to the Rose Garden once every year to read the names of transgender women, of people of color who have been killed in the past year. I will make sure that we read their names so that as a nation, we are forced to address the particular vulnerability 
on homelessness. I will change the rules now that put people in prison based on their birth sex identification rather than their current identification. I will do everything I can to make sure that we are in America that leaves Thank no one behind. Thank you, Senator Warren. Anna? Vice President Biden, uh, let's turn now to Afghanistan. Confidential documents published last week by the Washington Post revealed that for years, senior U.S. officials misled the public about the war in Afghanistan. As Vice President, what Warren did Lansford? you know? Afghanistan, you said? Yes, sir, Afghanistan. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. As yeah. Vice President, what did you know about the state of the war, and do you believe that you were honest with the American people about it? The reason I can speak to this, it's well known, if any of you follow it, my view on Afghanistan. I was sent by the president before we got sworn in to Afghanistan to come back with a report. I said there was no comprehensive policy available, and then I got in a big fight for a long time with the Pentagon because I strongly opposed the nation-building notion we set about. Rebuilding that country as a, as a whole nation is beyond our capacity. I argued from the very beginning that we should have a policy that was based on an anti-terrorism policy with a very small footprint that in fact only had special forces to deal with potential threats from that territory to the United States of America. The first thing I would do as President of the United States of America is to make sure that we brought all combat troops home, entered into a negotiation with the Taliban, but I would leave behind special forces in small numbers to be able to deal with the potential threat unless we got a real good negotiation accomplished to deal with terrorism. That's been my position from the beginning. That's why I think Secretary Gates and some members of the Pentagon weren't happy with me. Mr. Biden, the question was about your time in the White House, though. And I'm in talking that, about the White House. In that Washington Post report, there's a senior national security official who said that there was constant pressure from the Obama White House to produce figures showing the troop surge was working, and I'm quoting from the report here, despite hard evidence to the contrary. What do you say Since to that? Since 2009, go back and look. I was on the opposite side of that with the Pentagon. The only way I can speak to it now is because it's been published. It's been published thoroughly. I'm the guy from the beginning who argued that it was a big, big mistake to surge forces to Afghanistan, period. We should not have done it. And I argued against it constantly. Senator Sanders, you have your hand up. Well, in all due respect to my, to Joe, Joe, you're also the guy who helped lead us into the disastrous war in Iraq. What we need to do is, I think, rethink, and, and the Washington Post piece was very educational. What we need to th rethink is the entire war on terror. We have lost thousands of our own men and women, brave soldiers. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people have been killed abroad or forced to leave their countries, it is time right now that we bring this world together to try to end these endless wars and address the root causes which are causing these wars. Senator Sanders, you, you do often point to your vote against the war in Iraq as evidence of your judgment on foreign policy, but you did vote for the war in Afghanistan, and as recently as 2015, you said you supported a continued U.S. troop presence there. Uh, was that support a mistake? Well, only one person, my good friend Barbara Lee, was right on that issue. She was the only person in the House to vote against the war in Afghanistan. She was right. I was wrong. So was everybody else in the House. But to answer your question, I don't think you do what Trump does and make foreign policy decisions based on a tweet at 3 a.m. in the morning or desert your longtime allies like the Kurds. I think you work with the international community. You remove all troops over a period of time, a short period of time, within one year. Thank you, Senator. Mayor Buttigieg, you served in this war, but I want to ask about your decision-making if you were elected commander-in-chief. You have pledged to withdraw all U.S. troops from Afghanistan <laughs> within your first year as president, but the Taliban today control or contest more than half the country. Mm -hmm. So should you, as president, still withdraw all those U.S. troops if the country could once again become a haven for terrorists? We're going to leave one way or the other. The question is to make sure we do it well and not poorly. And of course, 
That has to respond to the conditions on the ground and the need for a political settlement. But, you know, the other day I was reunited with somebody that I served with over there. And the thing we were marveling at is how long it's been since we left. I thought I was one of the last troops turning out the lights when I left years ago. And we're still there. There may need to be some kind of limited special operations and intelligence capacity. The exact same kind of thing, by the way, that we actually had in Syria, holding the line before the president yanked it out, leading to the road to chaos. But what we know is that we cannot go on with these endless wars. And I'm glad that the name of Barbara Lee was mentioned, uh, not only because of what she's talked about years ago. I believe that we have no choice but to go to Afghanistan after 9-11. But right now, she is one of the leaders of the effort to repeal and replace the authorization for the use of military force. And the folks that I served with deserve that. They deserve the clarity of members of Congress being able to summon the courage to take an up or down vote on whether they ought to be there in the first place. And when I am president, any time, if I am forced to deploy troops into war, any time we seek an authorization, it will have a three-year sunset. So that if there really does have to be a conversation about extending it, it has to be brought to Congress, brought to the American people, and those members of Congress have to take that tough up or down vote. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Tim? Yes. Moving to health care, an issue that voters tell us every day is still the number one priority for them. Senator Sanders, you've spent plenty of time discussing and defending the merits of your Medicare for All plan, but the reality is that if Republicans retain control of the U.S. Senate, or even if Democrats win back a narrow Senate majority, your plan as constituted probably would not have the votes to pass Congress. So the question, Senator, is if Congress rejects your plan and the American people are looking to you for leadership on this issue, are there smaller, specific measures that you would take immediately to expand coverage and decrease costs as president? Well, Tim, at a time when we're spending twice as much per capita on health care as any other nation, when 87 million people are uninsured or underinsured, when 30,000 people are dying each year because they don't get to a doctor when they should, and when a half a million people are going bankrupt because of the dysfunctional and cruel system that we currently have, you know what? I think we will pass a Medicare for all single payer system, and I will introduce that legislation in my first week in office. Now to answer your question, I think when we go out to the American people and tell them that right now we have got to take on the greed and corruption of the pharmaceutical industry, for example, which in some cases charges us 10 times more for the same exact drug as is charged in this country. When the American people understand that Medicare for All expands Medicare to cover home health care, dental care, eyeglasses, and hearing aids, and does it at a cost far, far lower than what some of my opponents are talking about, you know what? We're going to have the American people behind us. We will have Congress behind us. Thank you, Senator Sanders. Vice President Biden, I'd like to bring you in. You spent an awful lot of time 10 years ago trying to pass a bill far less ambitious than what Senator, Senator Sanders is talking about here. Is he being realistic? I don't think it is realistic. Let me explain why. I introduced a plan to build on Obamacare. It remind everybody, 20 million people got insurance, didn't have it before. All people with pre-existing conditions are able to be covered. That could go on. We didn't get all that we wanted. But now that it's been exposed, that taking it away is such dire consequences, I've added to the Obamacare plan the Biden initiative, which is a public option, Medicare, if you want to have Medicare, but reducing significantly the price of drugs, deductibles, et cetera, by, made by underwriting the plan to a tune of about $750 billion, billion dollars and uh, making sure that we're able to cover everyone who is, in fact, able to be covered. Hey, put your hand down for a second, Bernie, okay? Just waving to you, Joe. I know, I know. Say hello. I know. So look, it covers everybody. It's realistic. And most importantly, it lets you choose what you want. Here, you have 160 million people negotiated their health care plans with their employer, like many of you had. You may or may not like it. If you don't like it, you can move into the public option that I propose in my plan. But if you like it, you shouldn't have Wall you shouldn't have Washington dictating you. You cannot keep the plan you have. Thank you, Vice President Biden. Funny, okay. Senator Sanders, 45 seconds to respond. 
Under Joe's plan, essentially, we retain the status quo. That's not true. No, that is exactly right. true. And, but, thank you. And, by the way, Joe, under your plan, you know, you asked me how we're going to pay for it. Under your plan, I'll tell you how we're paying for it right now. The average worker in America, their family makes 60000 a year. That family is now paying $12,000 a year for health care, 20% of the income. Under Medicare for All, that family will be paying $1,200 a year because we're eliminating the profiteering of the drug companies and the insurance companies and ending this Byzantine and complex administration of thousands of separate health care plans. So Senator Cody, I'm going to come to you. My name was mentioned. Yes, I'm going to come to you for 45, 45, 45 seconds. 45 seconds. The only guy that's not interrupted here, all right? I'm going to interrupt now. It costs $30 trillion. Let's get that straight. $30 trillion over 10 years. Some say it costs $20 trillion. Some say it costs 40 The idea that you're going to be able to save that person making $60,000 a year on Medicare for All is absolutely preposterous. 16% of the American uh, public is on Medicare now, and everybody has a tax taken out of their paycheck now. Tell me, you're going to add 84% more, and there's not going to be higher taxes? At least before he was honest about it. Oh, Joe. It's going to increase personal taxes. They're going to be... That's Medi right. We are going to increase personal taxes. But we're eliminating premiums. We're eliminating co-payments. We're eliminating deductibles. We're eliminating all out-of-pocket expenses. And no family in America will spend more than $200 a year on prescription okay. drugs. Okay. Senator Klobuchar, our plan will save the average worker far more. Okay. Okay. Senator Klobuchar, we'd like to hear from you. Okay. Yes. Senator Klobuchar, we'd like to hear from you. 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 I, I'll say this. First of all, Bernie, I promise when I am your president, I will get our pharmaceutical bills done. And we have worked together on this time and time again, and I agree with you on that. But where I disagree is I just don't think anyone has a monopoly on bold ideas. I think you can be progressive and practical at the same time. Uh, that is why I favor a public option, uh, which is a nonprofit option, to bring the cost down. And yes, it does bring the cost down immediately for 13 million people, and then we'll expand coverage to 12 million people. But here's the political problem. This fight that you guys are having isn't real. Your fight, Bernie, is not with me or with Vice President Biden. It is with all those bunch of those new House members, not everyone by any means, that got elected in that last election in the Democratic Party. It is with the uh, new governor, Democratic governor of Kentucky, uh, that wants to build on Obamacare. And the way I look at it, if you want to bridge, build, if you want to cross a river over some troubled waters, you build a bridge, you don't blow one up. And uh, I think that okay. you should build on the Affordable Care Act. She mentioned Thank you, Senator Cohen. Senator Warren, Susan, we would like to bring you in. She took my name in vain. Oh. She hurt my feelings. I am crushed. Can I respond? Never, never, I, never. Uh, my fight, Four, Amy, 45 seconds, Senator. Right. My fight, Amy, is not with the governor <laughs> of Kentucky. My fight and all of our fights must be with the greed and corruption of the pharmaceutical industry, with the greed and corruption of the insurance industry. These guys last year made a hundred billion dollars in profit and tens of millions of Americans cannot afford to go to a doctor tonight. The day has got to come. And Joe is not talking about it. Amy is not talking about it. The day has got to come. And I will bring that day about when we finally say that the drug companies and the insurance companies, the function of healthcare is to provide it for all of our people in a cost-effective way, not to make massive profits for the drug companies and the insurance companies. Thank you, companies Senator, 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 Senator Warren. Warren. We we need it again. We'd, lo we'd, like, we'd like to bring you into this discussion. The, the, the same question to you that I posed to Senator Sanders. If Congress rejects a Medicare for All proposal and you're the president, are there smaller specific measures that you could pursue with bipartisan support to decrease costs and expand coverage? So this is about costs. It's about costs on middle class families. Last year, 36 million Americans didn't have a prescription filled because they couldn't afford it. And those are people with health insurance as well. People who can't do the co-pays, people who can't do the deductibles, people who find out that the drug is not covered. So here's how I approach this. 
I want to do the most good I can for the most people as quickly as possible. On day one, I'm going to attack the prices on commonly used drugs like EpiPens and insulin and bring down those prices. The president can do that, I love saying this, all by herself. And I will do it. Uh, that's going to save families hundreds of millions of dollars. And then in the first hundred days, because I found a way to pay for full health care coverage for everyone without raising taxes on middle class families, you, I'm going to make available to people for a, a full health care coverage for 135 million people. It'll be at no cost at all, and they can opt into that system. Thank you, For Senator. others, it will be at a low cost. We have got to start moving and move fast. We, we do have to do move that. on. Okay. We can do that on 50 votes. Thank you, Senator. So, Judy. We are coming to the end of our time. A lot of hands up. We apologize for that. But in the spirit of the season, I'd like to ask each one of you, is there someone else among these candidates that you would have, you have two options, one a candidate from whom uh, you would ask forgiveness for something maybe that was said tonight or another time, <laughs> or, or a candidate to whom you would like to give a gift. And I'm going to start with you, Mr. Yang. Wow. labor action and just all go on strike on this one, Andrew. <laughs> um, I don't think I have much to ask forgiveness for. You all can correct me on this. Um, in terms of a gift, uh, Elizabeth has done me the honor of starting to read my book. Yes. I would love to give each of you a copy of my book. <laughs> it's, about, <laughs> it's about how we're going through the greatest economic transformation in our country's history, the fourth industrial revolution. It is grinding up our communities, and D.C. Okay. is out to lunch on this. Our media yeah. organizations are not covering it adequately. I wrote a book on it, and uh, if you like data, this book is for you. This goes for the people at home, too, if you like data and books. Mayor Buttigieg asked... Mayor Buttigieg asked forgiveness or give a gift? Uh, well, um... First of all, I love data and books, so uh, I think uh, we should all be excited about this. Um, and come to think of it, I should probably send my book around more, too. Um, look, I think, will thank you. I think all of us want the same thing at the end of the day. We know what a gift it would be to the future and to the country for literally anybody up here to become president of the United States compared to what we've got. And 